Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. And what an interesting day we have here. Commitment day has arrived for four-star quarterback Matt Zollers, the guy that a lot of you know observers in the recruiting world, Georgia fans themselves, really like. It has been, to me, really mysterious to try to figure out exactly what is going to happen with Zollers. You know, is this is is this Georgia's QB one? Is is Georgia Zoller's first choice? And today we're going to try to do what we can to unravel that mystery here a few minutes off the uh, top of the program. Also, by the time we speak again tomorrow, Georgia will have heard some news about another commitment of note. That's uh, the four-star offensive lineman, Mason Shorts. We'll talk a little bit about that today on the program, too. Terrence Edwards joins us. Great stuff on the very famous photo that he has of Ellis Robinson, the interception from practice. Also, what Kirby Smart had to say about wide receivers. Terrence gives his own thoughts on the Georgia pass catching targets. We're very, very busy on this day-to-day recruiting at the forefront. Glad to have you with us for it. It's Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Mary and Tharp, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Mary and Tharp, your source for Georgia divorce. Find them online at the Atlanta Divorce Team.com. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. I got to tell you, I really love days like today because I would say that today provides us with some honest to goodness, genuine mystery. And if you think about it for a moment, and this is not a bad thing, we love this, but it's true, is that the football seasons for Georgia don't really provide the same level of mystery they once did. Like when I was younger, when you were a little bit younger, you know, we would tune in on a Saturday or show up at the stadium on a Saturday just wondering if Georgia would win. You know, could Georgia beat this team they were playing? You know, will this be a win? Will this be a loss? Every Saturday had its own degree of mystery kind of baked into the uh, to the equation. There's very little mystery for most Georgia football games now, and I say that in full complimentary fashion and very, very thankful for it. Georgia now wins with so much regularity that we don't really have a whole lot of mystery surrounding the outcome of most of the games that Georgia play. So when we do get some genuine mystery, even if it ends up being maybe slightly disappointing, uh, when we do get some genuine mystery, I kind of find that to be fun. So today is decision day for four-star quarterback Matt Zollers. A lot of Georgia fans watching this very closely. And I have to say, and maybe some of you feel like you have a better handle on this than I do, and uh, perhaps you do. Many of you are probably smarter than me. But I have to say, as I'm sitting here, it's just after 10 a.m. on this particular Thursday, I have no idea what Zoller's going to do. I have no idea what his choice is going to be, and I find that to be really fun. I'll be watching like everybody else this afternoon when he makes his announcement. I think that George is in a pretty good spot here. We'll talk about why that is in a moment. But in terms of what's actually going to happen, I don't know. So so I wanted to try to see if we could in kind of like almost like true crime fashion here for a moment. Sort of look at all the clues that are out there and see if we can unravel this mystery at least a little bit and make the best educated guess that we can possibly make. This isn't a crystal ball or a whatever the other site calls their online predictions. This isn't anything like that. This is just, hey, based on this stuff that's out there, this is sort of our best guess as where we think all of this is going down. So I want to start with this. This week, I'm always glad to have a guy like Connor Riley, our Dog Nation colleague, in these Kirby Smart press conferences because Connor thinks about this kind of stuff sometimes from a big-picture perspective, recruiting perspective. And Connor, with the forethought that Zollers would be announcing his commitment decision today when Connor had a chance to uh, uh, you know, ask a question of Kirby Smart this week, brought up quarterback recruiting, the role that NIL plays in some of this right now, and just the bigger picture of you know, what are you looking for when you're looking for a quarterback here right now? Obviously, you know, there's seemingly no rules left in football anymore at all, or certainly in recruiting. One of the rules that we still do have is, uh, you know, coaches can't mention players by name, which is the dumbest thing in the world when they're a recruit. But so Kirby doesn't mention Matt Zollers by name here. Uh, technically, he can't, but it's obviously a hot topic given the fact that Zollers is about to announce So this is what Kirby said earlier this week on quarterback recruiting and the role that NIL plays in this. And as Kirby tells it, all recruitments here right now, this is Kirby from earlier this week. 
I mean, we're not recruiting quarterbacks, but I evaluate quarterbacks. You know, we watch them play high school. We bring them over here and, uh, and have them throw for us. We watch their games, which is by far and away the most critical thing we can have. Um, but, I mean, it would probably be a bigger picture of why are we saying they're not quarterbacks because the NIL has impacted the recruitment of every player. And in terms of where does that rank on their uh, scale, it's one of the first questions of um, is that is that number one priority? Is that number two, three, four, five, six? And do you list it that way because um, you actually feel that way or you just think it's the right answer? You know, it used to be, you know, every kid came in and said, well, the most important thing to me is my education. Well, I don't know many universities you get a bad education at. You know, they'll don't, they don't hand out bad educations. So is that truly what people were coming to school for 10, 15, 20 years ago? Um, is it truly what they're coming to school for now at NIL? So I'm answering the question because I don't really understand why specifically it's about quarterbacks. Um, it hasn't, like, all the treatment of quarterbacks or any position hasn't changed what we look at because of NIL. It might change what their motivating factor is, certainly, but not what we look for in terms of criteria. I want a um, self-starter. I want guys committed to the program, the selfless. Uh, I want all the same things, size, speed. I want all those same things. Uh, it's more be more selective over kids you pick and choose from that the NIL is not the uh, number one narrative. So I think there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, Kirby says that their overall evaluation of player at the position hasn't really changed. And yet at the end, he also says, listen, you know, basically we're looking for a good fit in the program that we're looking for someone who fits in well with what it is that we're trying to do. And obviously what's interesting to some Georgia fans about this is the fact that it certainly seems like that Zollers is not the only quarterback that Georgia perhaps might be considering. We know just the other day that uh, Georgia took a commitment from a 2026 quarterback, Jared Curtis, who's the number one player in the country for that cycle, according to 24-7 sports. We also know... Ryan Montgomery's name has come up, but most prominently, the in-state prospect, the you know arguably the most talked about recruit of all right now, the five-star quarterback Julian Juju Lewis. So the assumption that exists on the part of a lot of recruiting observers, Georgia fans, media types, whatever else, is that that Georgia is kind of sifting through all of these quarterbacks, looking at who's good on the field and also who's the the better fit for the program, and the fact that the timing of all of this. Zoller set to announce today with Julian Lewis set to take an official visit to Georgia basically a couple of months from now, slightly less than two months from now. I think for a lot of people, they find that to be really fascinating. Now, something else that Kirby Smart says in that clip that you just heard, kind of alluding to at one point in time, players were saying, oh, the main thing to me is what kind of education am I going to get? And Kirby kind of essentially insinuating that maybe when some players were saying that, they didn't always exactly mean it that way. Perhaps that's just sort of thought what they thought they were supposed to say. And I couldn't help but think about that, given what uh, Jeff Centel has written at DogNation.com this week about Matt Zollers. And, you know, when I read this to you, it's not going to be my insinuation that Zollers is somehow not telling the truth. But I do kind of wonder, just given the reality, the landscape that Kirby Smart just described, if this is an example of Zollers perhaps just sort of saying what he thinks maybe he is supposed to say. Let me read this to you. Jeff Sintel, dognation.com, a story you can read this week here at the website. Jeff writes that Zollers has told Dog Nation that NIL will not be a determining factor in his decision. What will be a factor, Jeff writes, is stability. He wants to play somewhere that he believes the head coach and the offensive coordinator aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Now, the interesting part about the last part of that statement from Jeff is we played this clip for you the other day that is almost exactly what almost exactly what Jared Curtis said his reason was for at the time somewhat surprisingly committing to UGA um that was his exact reasoning and he told that to Jeff in an interview that Jeff conducted with Jared up there uh, in Nashville so it's interesting that in this particular case Zollers according to Jeff's own telling is echoing very much the words of a guy who just committed to Georgia but the other part of that that NIL won't be the determining factor in the decision. You know, once again, you know, I would never accuse Zollers of not telling the truth, but I do wonder, is he just sort of saying that because that's what he feels like perhaps he's supposed to say? Or 
maybe it is true that NIL isn't the determining factor in his decision if he chooses Georgia. But we're also led to believe that there's another player on the scene. In fact, you'd probably say that there are, so to speak, five hats on the table for Zollers. There's Georgia. There's uh, He just visited Alabama. Maybe they're a hat on the table. You've got the two in-state schools. He's hailing from the state of Pennsylvania, the Keystone State, as it's known. Penn State and Pitt. He's got, a, I guess, a brother who's a walk-on at Pitt. But the other school here is Missouri. And for all the chatter about Penn State, he just visited there or whatever else. I think the conventional wisdom among those on the Internet who know people, who know people, who know people, is that this is a Georgia and Missouri battle. And as I said before, perhaps if you choose Georgia, given the success that they've had, given in particular the quarterback success they're having right now and what they have with Stetson Bennett prior to that, then maybe you could say that NIL is not a deciding factor. What if you choose Missouri? You know, you know, and, and I think people take this seriously that today that Missouri might be that choice. And you know, this is one of those moments in which I do think that Georgia fans have to be honest. You know, Missouri is a factor in recruitments where NIL is involved. That was true for Williams Winnery a year ago. It's probably true for Luther Burden the year before that. Missouri has probably been as aggressive as any state in terms of writing its NIL laws in a way that benefits the program to, you know, use NIL as an inducement and start paying their, you know, soon-to-be players as quickly as possible. This is true for players in-state and also just true, I guess, for players who are, you know, coming to the University of Missouri. Now, at this point in time, there's almost no NIL law or rule left, so I'm not really quite so sure how much that built-in advantage matters anymore, but that is an advantage that Missouri has enjoyed in the past. And, you know, I do think you have to give Missouri some credit for kind of establishing a little bit of a brand that way. For those of you who have ever played like Daily Fantasy or something like that, are you familiar with the theory of like stars and scrubs? That like if you're trying to build your biggest lineup, there is a theory out there of, okay, if I've got this sort of fictitious fantasy money to build my roster with, let me spend big on a few star players and then just sort of put some scrubs around them in the hopes that some of them play well. It sort of seems like in a roundabout way that's how Missouri goes about its football business there as well. They've got some NIL dollars that they seem to every year throw in the direction of kind of a high-value recruit and sort of hope for the best. And for the most part, it's kind of working, right? I mean, Eli Drinkwitz is on a lot more solid footing in the SEC than a lot of other co- coaches are. And Missouri was in the top 10 a year ago. They're kind of thought to be sort of a, you know, kind of a sort of dark horse, kind of off-the-radar playoff contender here this year. So some of this is kind of working. In fact, I'll admit this, is that – if you go to a website like On3, they cover recruiting, they cover the NIL space, and look at their NIL rankings, something that I don't always put a whole lot of stock and faith in. But if you go there and 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 look at all of that, what you actually see is a quarterback like Brady Cook, which I think to the average person may not be all that well known, maybe in comparison to Carson Beck, who's famous for the Lamborghini and you know all the chatter of, you know, perhaps being a first round pick next year and all that kind of stuff. But if you look at their overall NIL evaluations, and frankly, I don't take all of this all that seriously. I think some of this is grotesquely exaggerated. But uh, nonetheless, Beck comes in at number 10 on on threes NIL valuations with a valuation of $1.5 million. Uh, we know that Carson Beck's clearly cashing in on some NIL. We see the, the examples of that in his life. Uh, but shortly and not all that far behind back is Brady Cook, who I'd say is overall probably a lot less famous, but his NIL valuation is $1.1 million. He ranks 19th on On Three's NIL evaluation rankings list, and I thought it was kind of interesting. Cook is actually ahead of a quarterback like Julian Juju Lewis, who I would say just generates a lot more chatter. That gives you an idea of some of the way in which, you know, Missouri is supposedly, you know, kind of adding some NIL value to the players on its roster. So if you're thinking about Georgia versus Missouri for Mad Zollers today, I do think you have to take the NIL component of the Missouri side of this pretty seriously. And I think that Georgia has learned that in some recruiting battles in the past. So the question you kind of ask yourself in then is, well, what is the pull for Georgia then? You know, what is the number one argument for why Zollers would choose Georgia? And Here's where I think things get really fascinating for a moment. I want to show you this on the screen. A reporter who works for Rivals, his name is Jed May, he got a very interesting quote from Matt Zollers, and Jed shared this on X, the social media platform, here this week. 
in terms of why Zollers is so strongly considering Georgia and why the visit that Zollers just took to Georgia is, you know, giving him such a strong impression of UGA. The quote that Jed May has here from Matt Zollers is, they've told me many times I am their guy and they don't want anyone else. That is an incredibly provocative statement from Matt Zollers in that, as we said a moment ago, the perception that many of us have is, is that Georgia is currently looking at a lot of different options at the 2025 class. Ryan Montgomery perhaps a little bit, but we've been led to believe Julian Lewis to a huge degree because of just how overall well-known Lewis is as a recruit. But if we take Zoller seriously there, and frankly we have no reason not to, if we take Zoller seriously there, that Zollers is Georgia's guy. And if Zollers at 3 p.m. today announces for UGA, that essentially ends all recruitments of 2025 quarterbacks. Something else that Jeff Sintelis reported is that there is no talk among Montgomery or Zollers or Lewis or anybody about this being a two-quarterback class, the way that last year was originally intended to be with both Dylan Raiola and Ryan Puglisi. Apparently there is no talk right now about that happening for this 2025 class. It's like one quarterback. And apparently Matt Zollers today can become that one quarterback. Will he make that decision? Will he choose UGA? I don't know. But my prediction is, on the basis of that quote you just heard, that he probably will. Because ultimately, there is a lot of value at being the guy at Georgia. That's what Carson Beck has grown to be. That's what Gunnar Stockton may grow to be next. And that's what somebody after that may grow to be too. And that player very well might be Matt Zollers. There's a huge level, in other words, of value in being the only quarterback that Georgia wants to take for this class, if that's indeed what Zollers is. And that might be enough to win this for Georgia today, even if Missouri is in position to throw around more NIL dollars than perhaps Georgia's comfortable with, at least on the front end of Matt's story there at UGA. So as I said before, sometimes college football provides us with some honest-to-goodness, genuine mystery. I sort of feel like that's what this is. I am fascinated to see Will Zollers choose Georgia? Will he choose Missouri? If we hear Missouri's name, we probably have a kind of an understanding of why that might be. But if we hear Georgia's name, it tells us a lot more than just what Matt Zollers is doing. It tells us about priorities for the 2025 class, and it tells us just how good Georgia thinks Matt Zollers might be able to be. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Meriwether and Tharp. And we're happy to have you with us. No matter how you get to us, 945, first and 15, dognation.com, Dog Nation app, 10 a.m. everywhere else, radio, Athens, sports radio, 960, the ref, podcast, wherever you find them. We love our podcast audience. We appreciate your dedication, your loyalty, loyalty to us there. We post the show every day around that 12 o'clock hour right there at noon. You get that show showing up at your feed or at dognation.com. Always glad to have you there with us on all of that. And a huge thanks to our friends at Meriwether and Tharp who make all of this possible. You've heard me say for a long time that Meriwether and Tharp is your source for Georgia divorce. Now, here's what I love. I love the fact that right now that's more true than it's ever been before because we've been talking about Meriwether and Tharp for years. And for me, this is such a personal discussion because I know people who've, you know, availed themselves of Meriwether and Tharp services. And I've heard first person accounts of people who have. It will allow the team of attorneys there at Meriwether and Tharp to do great work for them. Challenging time, tough situation. We don't sugarcoat what divorce is. It can be a, a very hard and tough thing. And yet, Meriwether and Tharp provides, I believe, an invaluable service because they help people through one of the toughest times they may ever go through through the entire term of their life. Meriwether and Tharp is there to help you during that time. And for a long time, that's been true here in the Atlanta area. That's kind of where I live, here in the Atlanta area, and the people that I know who've you know, had communication with Meriwether and Tharp and, 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 and trusted them during their uh, divorce proceedings. They were also in the Atlanta area. But when you provide a good service and when you believe strongly that, that you're making people set up for success in kind of the next phase of their life, well, of course, you'd want to span, expand your reach if you could because that's what's right for people. And that's what Meriwether and Tharp has now done. Their website, we've been giving this to you now for a few months, and uh, it's sort of befitting the the situation. It's georgiadivorceteam.com, georgiadivorceteam.com, your source for Georgia divorce. You've heard us say this before. This is now completely true because there are offices in Peachtree City and Savannah and now in Athens. And so the same great care and support that Meriwether and Tharp has provided in the Atlanta area, they're now doing that essentially statewide in offices all throughout the state of Georgia. So please find them online 
If you find yourself in a challenging situation where you feel like divorce is the obvious and unavoidable next step for you, Meriwether and Tharp can educate you about that process. So find them online, georgiadivorceteam.com. That's georgiadivorceteam.com. Meriwether and Tharp, your source for Georgia divorce. All right. We are going to get Terrence Edwards here in a moment. Now, quick disclaimer. Terrence was uh, predisposed during his normal interview time, so he was good enough to join us early this morning to record this. So this is already in the can. Terrence gives you some stuff on Matt Zoller's coming up. Uh, also, kind of a look back on something we talked about yesterday, the really cool photo that Terrence shared of the Ellis Roberts intercept from practice that Georgia fans have seemingly had such a good time with. Uh, that's uh, good from Terrence. We'll get all of that here coming up in just a a little bit, already in the can. We already know that it's good, so we'll give that to you here coming up in just a a little bit. Prior to that, though, we'll go around the doghouse. And we started the show today by talking a lot about one particular recruit, Matt Zollers. He makes his decision announcement 3 p.m. today, by the time many of you listen to the show, by the way. It's it's kind of a funny thing. We're we're mostly an on-demand show. Far more people uh, connect with us after the show's been recorded than live. So a lot of you kind of already know the Zollers story, and you'll laugh at me if I got it all wrong. Uh, but nonetheless, um, um, that's coming up later on this afternoon. But by the time we do the show again on Friday, another major recruit will have announced his decision. That's the four-star offensive lineman, Mason Short. You know the story on Short, one-time Alabama commit, a guy who's been a highly ranked prospect for a very long time. And tomorrow he gets ready to make his choice. And I think this is going to be a fun thing to watch uh, on Dog Nation tomorrow morning as we kind of sift through all of this and sort of figure out what that's all about. But there's one aspect, and Jeff Sintel kind of dropped this a little bit for us last week when he was on uh, our program. We'll hear from Jeff again tomorrow. But in terms of, like, the overall narrative of mysterious recruitments and things that are interesting and what does it all mean, there's one aspect of Mason Short's recruitment, a very important offensive lineman, a guy I think that you really want Georgia to get tomorrow, kind of a potential kind of linchpin centerpiece of Georgia's offensive line recruiting for 2025 uh, there's one part of this that's also really interesting, too. Let me read you again from Jeff Sintel, this dognation.com this week, about a pretty abrupt change to the timeline involving Mason. Sure, Jeff writing that when he was asked about his timelines a week ago, the thinking was he wanted to take all of his official visits and then commit in late June, which has essentially become about the most, uh, I guess, normal time for a commitment uh, announcement to take place that – that June has become kind of the hot month for all of that. However, Jeff wrote at dognation.com this week, while that was the initial plan, Short quickly changed up his process over the last week and has now decided to make his decision this Friday. He says he's got a Final Four now, but it really feels like a decision between Clemson and Georgia. And as Jeff says, Dogs versus Tigers, two programs that were going to have beef throughout the entire summer on the recruiting trail for at least four big targets, and that starts with Mason Short on Friday. So you'd add probably a Josh Petty to that. You'd certainly add a David Sanders to that. But the first in what could be a series of skirmishes between Georgia and Clemson for offensive line prospects uh, involves Mason Short on Friday. Now, once again, look, my prediction here, maybe it's not a surprise, I'm going to go Georgia on this, and my reason for making that choice is, is that when Mason Short initially decommitted from Alabama, all of the energy in the early going was about George. Remember the helicopter that, that, that you know, right when Saban's retiring and right when all that change is happening, uh, you know, right when Mason Short's, you know, decommitting, I mean, Georgia just goes into fast motion. Heli- you know, Kirby Compter's flying out to see him uh, there at his high school. You know, he's taking that visit to Georgia. All of this happening very, very quick at a time when Alabama was trying to you know, kind of reboot the program with Kalen DeBoer as head coach. Georgia just had its ducks in a row, and they were going after Mason Shorthart. My assumption is that's probably enough to win the day for Georgia with Short tomorrow. And, you know, perhaps the acceleration of the commitment announcement is in is in response to, like, one of the things that, that Clemson sort of always done is, you know, they're putting pressure on guys to commit and then stop taking visits, right? That's, you know, you know Clemson, that's their strategy, and I would say at times that strategies work well. They like the sort of shutdown factor of if you're committed here, you can't go somewhere else. And, um, you know, they've, you know, Dabo Swinney has kind of used that to great effect from time to time. So you almost kind of wonder, well, is the acceleration factor here on this sort of a response to to whatever 
Matt Luke and Dabo Swinney are trying to do with a guy like Short, and this is George's way of perhaps just getting out in front of that, or maybe it's a completely different situation that I'm, you know, kind of reading wrong here. But A, Short's a player that you definitely want as part of this class. B, the fact that Georgia was so responsive so quickly right when Mason decommitted from Alabama, I think that probably means something. If I was making a prediction, and my online prediction is probably not worth all that much, but if I was making an online prediction on this, it would probably be for Georgia here. But either way, with 3 p.m. Matt Zollers today, 9 a.m. Mason Short tomorrow, by the time we do Dog Nation Daily again on Friday, we will have seen a couple of very compelling commitment announcements being offered and it'll give us a lot to talk about about where things stand for Georgia here in this class of 2025. And that is around the doghouse here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Thought. Now, for us, it's a Thursday staple. We always talk to uh, Terrence Edwards here on this program. Always a great thing to do. Today, though, a little different than sometimes, in that we did have to pre record it just before our show began. So, on kind of the battle for Mad Zollers and how that kind of factors into what we thought was going to be a battle for Julian Juju Lewis and what comes next and a really fun follow-up on a behind-the-scenes look at a Georgia spring practice. Let's do all of that and more. So there's some wide receiver talk mixed in here as well with Terrence Edwards here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. Always glad to have the great former Georgia wide receiver Terrence Edwards on the program today. Terrence also kind enough to join us here a little earlier than normal. He had some business to take care of. And, you know, Terrence, for a lot of Georgia fans, the thing on their mind today is decision day for quarterback Matt Zollers. And we were discussing this, you know, kind of a moment ago that, you know, if it really is sort of a Georgia-Missouri battle, Georgia fans sort of feel like they've been kind of down the road with Missouri before where NIL has been a factor for, like, say, Luther Burden or williams Winery, And you kind of wonder – you know, if a quarterback like this were to choose Missouri over Georgia, is that NIL kind of playing a big role all over again? Or, you know, the chance to come be at Georgia and have the success that we've seen Carson Beck enjoy or Stetson Bennett enjoy. When you think about big-time quarterbacks in this day and age, what do you think their thought process is like as they get ready to make a kind of a choice of this magnitude? Well, I think with any big time athlete right now, if you want to know big recruits, I think NIL is always going to play a part in your decision. Um, so I think that's uh, a big part. But then also play style, uh, who could develop you. So um, I still believe NIL is probably going to uh, weigh heavy, but development, uh, competition, and uh, just being to fit in the right place also should come into play. Yeah, when you use the word competition, that's obviously seemingly a big part of this, too. We know just a few days ago, Georgia got the commitment from Jared Curtis, who's, you know, one of the – he is the top quarterback for the class of 2026. So if you're going to be a 2025 quarterback at Georgia, you look at a situation where you expect Gunnar Stockton to be here, you expect Ryan Baglisi to be here, you have a guy like Curtis coming in behind you, that if you're going to choose to be a part of the Georgia program, whether it's Zollers or maybe a guy like Julian Lewis or – you know, Ryan Montgomery, any other name you might mention here, you are going to have to be pretty comfortable with a quarterback pecking order and a quarterback competition where, you know, probably nothing's promised to you, nothing's guaranteed. You just sort of have to fight for your spot. And that's got to be the kind of thing as a player that you're okay with if you're coming to a place like Georgia right now, correct? I think so. I think Carson is the lead dog and being able to uh, stay and develop and now look at him, and uh, he's projected probably to be a first-round pick next year. So you don't have to be a day-one starter to be a first-round pick. It's all about your potential. It's all about your skill set. So Carson is going to be a two-year starter and had an opportunity to be a first-round pick. So we have a guy there that who could preach being patient and understanding the long game. Um, so I just love some of these players. Just wish they could follow Carson Lee and just yeah. understand what – a team like Georgia could bring to you if you just stay patient. So I'm very honest about stuff like this. I mean, the guys who are in state, I just sort of feel like I know them better. I've known them longer. You know, I'm a little bit more aware of them. And when it comes to quarterback, you know, Zollers is a guy that I've played catch up on a little bit. And obviously, you know, I have a lot of respect for people who like him a lot. And so that matters to me. But Julian Juju Lewis, the other quarterback, is the guy that I probably feel like I've just sort of known more about and known you know, of, you know, kind of longer as a recruit. And certainly when you hear some things potentially coming out of the Zollers camp or the fact that it seems like Georgia stands at the ready to take this commitment today, 
it sort of sounds like that Georgia would be okay with Zollers instead of Lewis. And perhaps there's a way of interpreting this that that Georgia would prefer Zollers to, to Lewis. There's at least, you know, s- some believe that might be true there as well. What do you make of that? Now, as it stands right now, Lewis is still technically committed to USC, but he's supposed to take an official visit to Georgia during the summer, and yet you'd be left to wonder what the point of that visit would be if, if, Lawler, if, if Zollers does commit today. Lewis is a highly touted, you know, a young man that's been famous for a very long time, but maybe not quite making that connection with Georgia if uh, Zollers makes this choice here today. What do you make of, like, what all of this could potentially mean for a guy like Juju, who is as, you know, kind of touted as almost any, you know, Georgia quarterback probably since Trevor Lawrence? Right. I've known Juju and been around Juju probably since he was six or seven years old. So I know the family very well, know his father, TC. So um, I could understand uh, them looking around. I could understand their commitment to USC. I Me, mean, uh, Lincoln Riley resume speaks for itself. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Kirby Smart and company have to protect the program. Mm-hmm. And if they believe dollars is on point and it's, it's have the same skill set, have the same potential, uh, then you have to take which one wants to come first. Uh, you can't wait on either, in my opinion. Yeah. You have to protect the program. And if one says they want to come, you have to take them. If you believe both of those guys are transcendent or just a quarterback that you can believe that, that can lead this program or continue to lead this program to the standard that we we set. So I'm okay with Kirby and company protecting the program. I'm okay with him taking – they believe both are – in the same pecking order, I'm okay with them taking a commitment from one quarterback, even if it's not Juju. We had a, a good time yesterday with the photo that you shared on social media, and it was actually a great follow-up to the topic that you and I addressed last week, the impression that guys like K.J. Bolden and Ellis Robinson made on you when you had a chance to see Georgia practice, and you mentioned in particular uh, a Robinson interception that you described kind of in the mold of something that Champ Bailey would have done. And we saw the picture that you shared on X this week. I think we were all left to confirm, yeah, that really does look like something that Champ Bailey, you know, would have done. You were telling me before our interview began that uh, the picture probably doesn't do the actual play itself justice, but boy, the picture is uh, pretty impressive to see. Nonetheless, how much fun have you had with the Georgia fans who have seemingly loved this little glimpse at practice and this, you know, five-star freshman who obviously has a lot of, you know, sort of growing expectations here. Uh, how much do you love the fact that Georgia fans got such a kick out of the picture that you shared there? Yeah, it's a great picture. Um, we, we all understand why he was the number one rated cornerback coming out, and we understand the expectations that we all believe that he can bring. And it's it's a spring practice. It's one play. And a lot of times we, we get enamored with players uh, that we believe that could be who we think they are. So I'm ready to see him against competition. I'm ready to see him in the spring game. I'm ready to see him against uh, real-life competition and, and see what he's all about. But I believe – He's uh, one of the best. I think he's his talent. He he has the potential to be one of the better players to come out of Georgia. Now he just have to showcase it on Saturday. Well, I think the other thing too is we kind of live in a day and age in which the transfer portal is a real thing, and you know I think there's extra attention paid then to the players that have a chance to make the immediate impact. Because as you know, Terrence, if you don't make the immediate impact in this day and age, who's to say we ever get a chance to see you play? And and so in the case of Robinson. I think the other thing that makes him so exciting for Georgia fans right now is the idea that this is one of those guys that you may not have to wait to see and that one of those players that maybe has an uncertain future because, you know, who knows how he fits into the picture. You know, this is a guy who could be competing for playing time right now. There's obviously a very crowded situation for Georgia at cornerback. Dalen Everett's got a lot of experience. Guys like Daniel Harris and uh, Julian Humphrey obviously returned to Georgia for a reason. They both believe they're starter-level players. We wouldn't certainly argue with them on that. But Robinson also is also one of those factors there, too, where you think he might be able to play for Georgia here this season. I think that's another reason that makes this freshman so exciting because of the immediate impact he has a chance to make. Yes, I think he's going to be able to play this year. How much, I don't know, because he's so ultra-talented. Um, but that whole group of, of DBs is ultra-talented. And I can tell you this, watching uh, Derek – Don, Darryl Harris, Don, Darryl Harris, right? That's yeah, Daniel Harris, yeah, Daniel Harris, yeah. Daniel Harris, he he changed his number to number seven, and he looked just like Trayvon Diggs out mm. there to me, like big, long, and he just looked the part. Uh, so we have a really, really good group of DBs. So it's just excited to see uh, what those guys could do when the real bullets is flying. So I'm excited for all of them, but 
uh, Robson, he's too talented to keep off the field. So I'm sure he'll be able to play in some sub packages, and I'm sure he'll definitely be on the special team. Uh, final topic here for a moment. Kirby Smart, when he talked to the media on Tuesday, spent a good bit of time, it's obvious because of the questions that were asked, but he spent a good bit of time talking about wide receivers. And I do think this is a very interesting crop of receivers for Georgia here this year. So anytime we have a chance to talk receiver, I'm always certainly very interested in your opinion. One of the names that came up was Arian Smith. And Arian's kind of like the veteran guy in the group. And obviously there have been moments for Arian. We all think about the Peach Bowl touchdown against Ohio State. That 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 play kind of turned that game around. He's always had the blazing speed. I think last year probably had a couple of drops, things moments he'd like to have had back. But what do you think the overall, overall outlook could be for Arian Smith here this year, someone that Kirby Smart was pretty candid in discussing the other day? Uh, I, I, I've been on the Arian Smith bandwagon since he got there with his elite speed. I just think last year he just lost some confidence um, in himself, uh, and he gained it back in the later part of the season. I think Coach Bobo did a great job of getting him the balls in ways that he just could feel and touch the ball, and he can be – like he's a part of a team and he's contributing to win. Um, so I, I just think he's going to have a, a excellent last ride for the Georgia Bulldogs. I mean, I th- we, we need him to be where we want to be. We we have to have Aaron Smith on the, on the field, making big plays down the field um, because Carson has the arm to get him. And Carson needs to believe in Aaron. Once he put the ball up, that Eric could go get it and he's going to finish those plays. So, I'm excited to see Arian play. He's had a good spring. He, he the day that I was there, he was making uh, plays yeah. out there all over the field. So yeah. uh, I'm excited to see him see him play and see him finally put it together for a full season. Another name that came up with Kirby the other day, and he also spoke to reporters himself. That's uh, Dominic Lovett. If I'm remembering back to last week, you said you also saw some good stuff from Lovett during the practice you got to attend as well. Is that true? Yes, I, I thought Lovett was the best receiver uh, out there. He was just making plays, uh, making tough catches, making easy catches, making routine catches, just being the guy that Carson looked for a lot. So I'm excited for Dom now to kind of uh, be be the man and get the opportunities that he came here for. Uh, we saw glimpses last year, but I think he's really going to put it together this year to be a uh, proper wide receiver one. And then, you know, one more name. This is a guy that you've been touting for a long time, and obviously last year that prediction for the most part came true, and now people kind of wonder if he can take the next step. You know, Kirby also talked about Dylan Bell a good bit yesterday, and I would say that, you know, Bell is that one guy that at the end of last season, you were just so, I'm talking about myself, you're so intrigued by what he could be here for this year. Do you see the opportunity? I mean, I would say that last year Dylan proved to be the kind of prospect that you had said that you thought he was coming out of high school, but do you see the building blocks in place there for him to take that even next step where all of a sudden now he's kind of one of those receivers that sort of leads the way for Georgia and, you know, kind of puts one of those stat lines together that's similar to what Aladdin McConkie could have done this past season had he been healthy, what he did do in 2022 or, you know, helping kind of fill the void that's left behind because Brock Bowers is no longer here. Like how big of a year do you think that Dylan Bell, a player that Kirby Smart talked about on Tuesday could possibly be? I think he's going to be uh, probably similar to Marcus. Just when you need a play, you're going to go to Dylan Bell. Uh, if that's jet sweeps or that screens, if that putting him in the backfield, that's throwing a halfback pass. I just think he's a guy when you need a play to be made, he's the guy that you're going to look for to make that play. Uh, he has reliable hands. He has to bite it to absorb all type of tackles that you can put him in all type of situations because he's, he's a hard nosed football player. So I'm just looking for him to be that guy, kind of the glue guy to do it all. Uh, if, if it have to go in there and block a linebacker on the screen, he's going to be that guy that, that does those things. a la uh, Marcus. Terrence, I tell you what, I always love talking football with you, but especially when it comes to the wide receiver position, really, really appreciate your insight on the program today. Hope you have a uh, great rest of your week. And uh, we'll look forward to having you back here on dog nation daily presented by Meriwether and Tharp again, very soon. Thank you for having me. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Fun conversation indeed there with Terrence Edwards looking at the end there at some of those Georgia wide receivers. And at some point in time, I want to get more into what Kirby Smart said about some of those guys. I don't know that we'll do it tomorrow because we have so much recruiting stuff going on. But early next week, pre-G-Day at least, we're going to get more into you know Kobe Young and Dylan Bell and Arian Smith and and what could be on display, Dominic Lovett, of course, what could be on display 
uh, for Georgia fans when they get a chance to watch the dogs for real at G-Day. That's two Saturdays from right now. For now, though, we're going to go cruise around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And there's a lot of reasons I love G-Day, but one of the things I love most is it reminds me that the Dog Nation crew is just right around the corner. We're ready to do that. Allure of the Seas is the ship that we're on. And at this point in time, obviously, the opportunity to be a part of Allure of the Seas and our Dog Nation cruise has kind of you know, gone away. We've kind of timed out on that, if you will. But I, I do believe that it's a reminder, though, to you that what Royal Caribbean's got going on right now, I think, is just really fun. And that for a long time, you know, Royal Caribbean's famous for like these really large, very impressive cruise ships. That's called the Oasis class of ships. For a long time, that was the largest class of ship at sea. And for the most part, these have always been kind of exclusively reserved for like seven night sailings. And if you can take a seven night sailing, I think you probably should. I think it's a great way to experience the best that a ship has to offer. But if you've got a family like me, everybody's busy doing their sports and things like that. Sometimes getting away for a full week, especially this time of year, not always an easy thing to do. So Royal Caribbean, a beautiful ship like Allure of the Seas, for instance, making that ship, an Oasis-class ship, available out of Port Canaveral on these three- and four-night sailings, I think it's a really good idea. And it's something I'm really glad that Royal Caribbean's now doing. And I can't wait to showcase that as a part of our Dog Nation cruise, you know, coming up in a couple of weeks. But in addition to that, I just love the fact that anybody who wants to can now experience kind of the best of Royal Caribbean, an Oasis-class ship, very large ship, all the various neighborhoods, the Boardwalk, the Central Park, the, the Aqua Theater, the, the, the great entertainment options. You can experience all that, and you can kind of do it with a very budget-friendly, time-friendly, you know, uh, calendar-friendly three, four-night sailing. So Jessica Slater is a wonderful travel agent. She can tell you more about this. Give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can also email her, jslater at dreamvacations.com. She can tell you all about all of that. All right, so we got a lot to talk about here for a moment. And I think I've told you this before that when it comes to some of the challenges facing college athletics, I've always felt that there's a certain aspect of this that I've, I think I've even said this in the show, been tried to, I've tried to admit this. I find it a little bit difficult to talk about some of this kind of stuff because there's something that sort of seems true to me that if you say it out loud, it sort of makes you sound like a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist. And nobody wants to be accused of that. I don't think it kind of, I don't know. It, it that's always a tough label to have to wear. But at the same time, when you watch some of the things playing out with, you know, college athletics, somehow out of nowhere, it just seems like there's like all this lawfare being like waged against college football and college athletics in general. And the sense that you have is, well, gosh, it just seems like somebody somewhere, some powerful people don't want college football to exist anymore the way that we've always seen it exist and the way that so many of us have chose to enjoy it. It seems like there's a group of people somewhere, a they somewhere, and they, air quotes around they, they don't like college football and they want it to go away. Well, here's something I'm here to tell you is that I think now that idea that there are powerful people somewhere that would like to kind of end college football as we know it that idea is no longer a conspiracy theory. That idea is now out in the open, in print, for everyone to read. There was a very interesting story published at The Athletic yesterday. Uh, Andrew Marchand, longtime uh, 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 business reporter, Stuart Mandel, longtime COVID panic porn peddler. But they team up together to uh, talk about what they describe as the institution of a college football super league. 80 teams coming together, essentially ending conferences as we know them, ending almost anything that sort of feels like the kind of tradition of college football, essentially a much larger version of how the NFL basically functions. You'd have promotion and relegation, which you know, you know, some of the European cosplay folks just love. Um, but, uh, you know, just this idea, very big idea, it's essentially an end to college football as we have known it and a replacement with something brand new. And I think the most important part of the story from The Athletic here, there are some very serious people who are involved in this idea of replacing the traditional college football model with a so-called super league that would have collective bargaining and, you know, players essentially treated as employees and, 
you know, uh, ownership up for stake with like, uh, you know, capital investment being involved and seem like that. So here's how the athletic describes the sort of, you know, collection of about 20 important people who are coming together on this. It's several college presidents. It's Roger Goodell's primary lieutenant at the NFL and some of sports top executives. They've devised a plan called the so-called Super League to completely transform college football. Uh, it's called the College Sports Tomorrow. That's the name of the group. And so you got, you know, those guys, the academic people involved here is a guy named Kent uh, Siverud, I believe you pronounced that. That's the chancellor of Syracuse. Uh, Gordon G., you'll remember him. He was at Vanderbilt at one point in time. He always wears a bow tie. He was at Ohio State. Now he's at West Virginia. He's the president uh, there. He's involved in this too. So I don't know that I take this seriously as something that's going to happen because when you look at the actual college folks involved, the dude from Syracuse is a total nobody. Nobody knows who that is. Gordon G. is a little bit embattled. He got a vote of no confidence recently from uh, his university at West Virginia. It seems like he's probably on his way out as university president there. So, you know, it's fairly low rungs of the academic ladder in terms of who's supporting this. It doesn't necessarily seem like any of the big boys from the big leagues, certainly SEC, Big Ten, they're all that involved in this here right now. But I do believe you ought to take it at least somewhat seriously that now we see out in the open that all of the lawsuits, because that's what keeps getting mentioned in this story over and over again, the lawsuits, the lawsuits, the lawsuits, the 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 fact that there's even more, you know, lawfare coming against college athletics with the, uh, there's a, a suit out there about back pay for previous college ath athletes. They might get some NIL money, and it just seems like, like, why is all of this legal stuff happening and why all of a sudden is there such a concerted effort, as I said before, seemingly anyway, to end college athletics as we've known it? Well, now you know, is because there are a group of people essentially, I mean, the bottom line overall takeaway from the story at The Athletic, and it's a subscription article, but if you are subscribed, you ought to read it. The bottom line is there's a group of people, think about like, you know, uh, sort of capital investment, you know, type people, you know, uh, uh, you know, hedge fund type people. They essentially want to buy college football, and they are, I would say, using the legal process and the long losing streak that college athletics, the NCAA, is having here in the uh, courtrooms as a way of devaluing the price so it can be more easily purchased. And this is a real thing that's attempting to happen. Now, I don't necessarily believe this, as it's described, is likely to happen, but but it is now out in the open that there are some people who want to replace college football with something else. And the thing they replace it with, they want to own. And I do believe you ought to take that somewhat seriously. Now, on a much lighter note, uh, our friends over 24-7 Sports, Brad Crawford was the writer, looking at the top rivalries in all of uh, college athletics. And I, um, this always kind of brings out something in me where I, I feel like when it comes to rivalries in college athletics, I feel like we don't always define what a rivalry is the proper way. And to me, the thing that makes a rivalry great is not always the prestige of the rivalry. Think about Ohio State and Michigan. That was the rivalry that came in uh, number one, according to uh, Brad Crawford, 24-7 Sports. We don't dispute. Uh, that's a big-time rivalry, and obviously it's taken on more meaning in recent years because Ohio State can't win it, and Michigan has used success in that rivalry as a springboard to winning this year's national championship. So that's clearly a very prestigious rivalry. But we would say that prestige is not always the best way to judge a rivalry. Like, uh, a rivalry that Crawford from 24-7 Sports had near the bottom part of the top 10 was the Egg Bowl between Ole Miss and Mississippi State. But if you've ever in, tuned in on a Thanksgiving night to watch that game, and of course you have, if you've ever tuned in to watch that, one thing you know is there aren't two teams in America that hate each other more than those two teams do. And there are not two fan bases in America that hate each other more than those two fan bases do. That there is great hatred. So when you think about a rivalry, it's not the prestige that often makes the rivalry great. It's the intensity of the feeling. And we'd say for the Egg Bowl, um, uh, you know, there is no more intense rivalry than that. I'll also mention this. Um, so Georgia, Florida came in at number five or so on the list, kind of right there in the middle of the top ten. I don't, I don't have it pulled up in front of me right now. But it's kind of like right there in the middle of the top ten. And I, I couldn't help but think, it wasn't that long ago, and we talked about this on the show, you know, Paul Feinbaum was going around saying that Georgia-Florida was the biggest rival in the SEC. Others have sort of echoed a similar thing here, that there was a real intensity to that rivalry when Dan Mullen was there. We don't like Dan Mullen. But the one thing that Dan Mullen did do well was he created 
a lot of intensity around the Georgia Florida rivalry. And for a while, I think a lot of us, based on what people kind of outside the bubble of Dog Nation were saying, a lot of us felt like Georgia Florida is like one of the biggest rivalries there was. Like Billy Napier has completely trampled all of that. So all of a sudden now, Georgia Florida as a rivalry is sort of recessing back to the middle of the pack again. Like, to give you an idea of just how much of a non-entity Napier's turned out to be, uh, the fact that the Georgia-Florida rivalry is suffering because of that, uh, the fact that Georgia's dominance in that series is so, we, we, we began the show by talking about the lack of mystery sometimes for, for Georgia games, the complete absence of mystery around who's going to win Georgia-Florida has essentially made it disappear as a rivalry. And for that, Billy Napier wears a great deal of shame. Uh, but Georgia, Florida, no longer ranked up near the very top of rivalries, at least according to one dude from 24-7 Sports. Now, speaking of Florida, one final uh, story here. So Graham Mertz, speaking of Paul Feinbaum there as well, Graham Mertz was on the Feinbaum show this week, and I thought he gave a pretty honest answer about the fact that Florida this year is playing such a difficult schedule. And we've said before that we think, you know, you make case, this may be, you know, one of the most difficult schedules that any team's ever played. And that's real. And I think that Billy Napier is likely to be fired because of it. I believe there's a chance that Napier may have been fired before this past, uh, you know, at the end of last season, if not for the fact they'd be throwing a new coach to the Wolves with a schedule such as this. But what Mertz said was, is that it's creating an extra sense of urgency for them because they know how tough the schedule is going to be. And that's why you come to the SEC and all of that, which I think is probably a fine answer. And we talked yesterday about DJ Lagway a little bit. I do think the comparison between Mertz, who, Last year for Florida really wasn't terrible. They didn't have a terrible year. Uh, Florida was obviously awful, but, you know, Mertz wasn't terrible. You know, Mertz's ability to hold off D.J. Lagway, who's, you know, kind of an emerging quarterback, an exciting prospect, that's probably a pretty interesting storyline for Florida to the extent they're capable of having any success possible. But in addition to that, you know, we've said before that where the Florida schedule really gets tough is in, like, November, starting with Georgia, ending with Florida State, a bunch of tough games in between, it's a November, not a November to remember. It'll be a November to forget. I can promise you that for the Gators, lousy, stinking Gators. So the question is, you know, can they do something early season to sort of stave off a total disaster? You know, for instance, they've got a game against Texas A&M. They seem like they play Texas A&M almost every year, it seems like, weirdly enough. Uh, A&M's season win projection right now is 8.5. They're, you know, kind of in the upper half of the SEC, upper almost the upper third of the SEC in terms of season win projections. That's not an easy game for Florida. They'll be an underdog in that game. You know, could they find a way to to steal a game like that? They've got Miami. Once again, Miami probably on paper better than Florida, uh, but not an unwinnable game if you're the lousy, stinking Gators. Can you find a way to at least give yourself that, to sort of save some face moving to that tough stretch? they got Kentucky coming up there as well. Do you realize this? Kentucky has beaten Florida in football three years in a row. That um, that all of a sudden now, that's the kind of game that at one point in time, Florida had a 30-game winning streak against the Wildcats, and now that winning streak, streak at least for the brief period of time, has been reversed. Uh, that's one of those games. It's like, you know, you can't give that away knowing everything you've got to play in November. So tricky stretch coming up for the uh, Florida Gators here this season. Graham Mertz says they're motivated by that. They better be. Otherwise, it's going to be a total disaster. And we'll make that cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Oh, and by the way, before we uh, wrap up today, let me also give a great shout-out here. Our friends at Precision Garage Door. I love what they're doing for people in our audience because one of the nicest things you can do as a neighbor is not have one of those garage doors that goes rah, 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 when you're trying to uh, lower it. And so if you want to make sure your garage door is humming the way that it's supposed to, that's what Precision Garage Door can do for you. They've got a five-star reputation for service they earn over and over again each and every day. Phones answer 24-7. You can always get in touch with a garage door replacement or repair specialist whenever that need arises for you. So if you just need a simple repair or if you need something a little bit more substantial, Dog Nation's choice on all of this to get the job done for you are our friends at Precision Garage Door. And there's a $29 service fee that's always going to be waived anytime you get some repair work done. So that's one of the ways they take good care of you. So I want you to find them online. It's a neighborly company helping you be a good neighbor with a great-looking garage door right there in your own neighborhoods. It's PrecisionGarageDoorGeorgia.com. One more time to get a quote today, PrecisionGarageDoorGeorgia.com. So when we first started the idea of doing a show, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp, like one of the ideas that I had is, you know, I'd love to be able to keep people company when they're out there 
taking care of business, getting work done, or they're exercising, doing things like that. I'd love to be able to join them, accompany them, and kind of help people from getting too bored or whatever. You know, just give people a chance to, to uh, you know, do what they're doing and kind of, you know, keep them company while they're doing that. And there's nothing more gratifying for me all these years later when I see examples of just how true that really is. In fact, our golden shoe today. So John uh, McKay was kind enough to share this with me. Uh, he says, here's a photo from my run today, 3.18 miles, listening to today's episode of Dog Nation Daily. So, John, I first of all, congratulations on a great run. Love to see you there in the Georgia gear there, too. And thank you so much for taking us with you on that journey. It makes me feel like I got a little exercise, too, which is never a bad thing. So, John, great job. Golden shoe coming your way. Lousy, stinking gators. Motivated by a tough schedule? Well, here's some motivation for you, too. It's been 1,244 days since you've beaten Georgia. That is our Gator Hater Updater, and that is why you are lousy, stinking gators. We'll see all of you back here tomorrow, perhaps with some commitments to discuss. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. We'll look forward to talking to you then. And on video, time now for the RS Andrews Cooldown. RS Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised the price. It's promised you can trust them on all of that. By now, y'all sort of know the drill. If it's good news later on this afternoon, we could be back on video again maybe to talk about that. We may have a little bit more substantial coverage of Mason Short tomorrow morning. All of this still very much just kind of in the uh, in the discussion phase here right now. But you never know. You never know how it could possibly play out. So let me go to Facebook first today. We'll get a few comments over there. And I'll go around the rest of the comment sections there too. And if you got some thoughts on what Zoller is going to do, what Short will do tomorrow morning. Uh, you want to talk about the Super League? We can do that there as well. Anything you want to do, we're able to do all of that with you. All right, let's uh, uh, Mike Mazzell says, what are our chances of getting him? I believe that's in reference to Zollers. I think the Georgia's got a very good chance. I would say that um, my pick would be that it would choose Georgia here today, but perhaps that's based more on just a hunch than anything else. Um, Jacob O'Neill says, I do so many exercises, I reward myself with a cruise. Yeah. <laughs> in a roundabout way, maybe so. I actually do I believe you'd never tell from looking at me, but I do exercise fairly frequently. Imagine how bad I'd look if I didn't. I guess that's the, uh, I, I guess that's the, uh, the takeaway there. Let's see what else. Uh, William Camacho, and this is true words that have never been spoken. He says, as long as the offense averages forty-four points a game, defense gives up under ten. He says nobody's going to beat us. I'd say that's probably true. I'd say that's true. Rody Williams says that Georgia's got so much talent, we just got to find a way to get them all on the field. And that's always the trick, right? It's like, you know, how do you utilize the weapons that you have and how do you make sure that, you know, one football, only one guy can touch it at a time? How do you make sure the right guys are touching it? Rody, I think you're right about that. Uh, let's see what else is going on here today. Uh, Joseph Kennedy wants to see Roderick Robinson running straight up the middle. Listen, one of the things he's going to be is a you know big, strong back. And, you know, it's the oldest cliche in the book, but it's kind of a cliche for a reason. The idea of the thunder and lightning back. We think that Trevor Etienne is supposed to be the lightning. And Roderick Robinson right now is kind of getting that first nod, seemingly anyway, especially with the injury to Branson Robinson, uh, kind of getting that first nod to be the uh, thunder. And we'll see if he makes good on some of these projections both G-Day and during the season there, too. Uh, Denise Loper, really excited about Jared Wilson. Yeah, one of the most fun things of the spring thus far has been the really complimentary words thrown in the direction of Wilson because i got to tell you, it is not easy uh, replacing a guy like Cedric Von Prahn, who was, I mean, it's kind of funny, you know, Van Prahn will only be like a mid-round draft pick probably, but when it comes to kind of bulletproof, draft profile like Cedric Von Prahn it's not going to let anybody down he's going to be a you know I don't know multi-year starter in the NFL I mean he's about as sure thing as you can get it makes you kind of wonder well, why are you going to draft him so late if you feel so certain about his ability to be a contributing player um I do think the center position has taken on more value in the NFL in recent years and I think it's a reminder to Georgia that you know, replacing Van Praan is difficult because of who he was as a player and as a man, but also the center position is just a really important bedrock for the continuity on your offensive line. So tough job awaiting Jared Wilson. 
the fact that we're hearing so many good things about Wilson, those are not empty, hollow statements. That's a really important thing for a, a player that really matters. Uh, David West checking in. Glad to have you here, David. Uh, Jacob O'Neill says, a little chilly in southeast Georgia. Yeah, I wore the sweatshirt yesterday. It was actually probably a little warmer yesterday than I thought it was going to be. Today, you get that little bit of chill in the wind. So, you know, you're not quite uh, full-fledged spring yet, I don't guess. You always have that little, you know, last stand for winter at some point in time. Uh, Ulysses Dunnings, is it Miriam's birthday today? Happy birthday, Miriam. Thank you, Ulysses. Ulysses, I appreciate that. And happy birthday to Miriam. Good, good stuff. Uh, David uh, Wayne Carroll says, our defensive secondary is going to be one of the best in the nation. I certainly believe that's the case. I do. I believe you're probably right about that. Uh, ooh, uh, online prediction uh, for Zollers to Missouri. So there you go. Uh, uh, it's the Steve Wilfong, dude, uh, respected reporter. Uh, usually, usually he's not guessing. Uh, so uh, if that's the case, then uh, perhaps some of the stuff we suggested earlier may be the reason why. So there you go. Uh, Wayne Folan. But we hadn't seen Wayne in a little while. Uh, good to see him. Wayne's up in Pennsylvania. So you know, Pennsylvania quarterback uh, decision later on, that, that brings Wayne out. Uh, good to see Wayne here today. Uh, a, a very nice thing. Boy, lot, we've had a lot of blasts from the past here lately. Uh, Andy Gilley says, but the Eagles get set up on Bron Granger. Yeah, that, that, that sort of feels like them, right? And plus, uh, Kelsey just retired too, right? So you got that going on. Um, Uh, Mark Drury wants to see the ball in Dylan Bell's hand as much as possible. I, I would agree with that. I really, I really grew to like Dylan Bell a lot last year. Really did, especially late season. I thought he really came on. Um, yeah, so I'm a little disappointed about. I mean, I'm certainly not waving the white flag here, but um, and there's obviously a lot of moving pieces for Georgia when it comes to quarterback, but uh, but. You know, if, when big names start making their online predictions, they're typically doing that because of of <laughs> it's sort of Martha Stewart style inside information. Usually, um, uh, let's see what else. Let me go over to uh, to YouTube for a moment. See how those folks over there are doing. On the YouTube side of things. Uh, uh, Jonathan Aaron says, what would be your top 10 rivalries? It doesn't have to be in any order. Definitely Egg Bowl is on there. I think you got to put Georgia, Florida on there. You got to put Auburn, Alabama on there. Um, I think Alabama, Tennessee has got to be on there. I would say that Georgia, Auburn has got to be on there. I know this is very SEC centric. I'm just trying to think of the SEC ones that I think have to be there. Is that five SECs? That may be enough. Um, it's like, then I guess you you probably get into Texas, Oklahoma, um, Ohio State, Michigan. Uh, like the one thing that the guy from 24-7 also put, he put two basketball rivalries on there. He put um, uh, he put Carolina Duke and he put Kentucky Louisville. And I, I'll allow that. I, I do think those rivalries are big enough to at least be in the discussion. He also mentioned Army-Navy. And I would say that Army-Navy is a little bit – different for me because like army navy is a very classy football game right you know respected people classy game uh and i know that the whole thing is always go army beat navy or you know the opposite but it doesn't feel like the same vein of rivalry right i mean it's a important part of college football's tradition until some you know uh investment fund buys the sport and sells that for parts but uh uh but it's an important part of college football's tradition, but I don't know that I think about army Navy as like rivalry, certainly not in the same vein of the egg bowl. But does that make sense? Um, Mark Woodman, he says it's a great game to go to. I don't doubt that. I'd love to go at some point. In time. I, I, I love the game. I love the uniforms. I, I love all of it. Um, but to me, it's just sort of in a class by itself, very different than the rivalries that we're talking about here. Stephen Venanzi says, uh, we talked the other day about wanting to see some of those Big Ten stadiums. 
He says, you definitely need to check out some of those uh, Big Ten stadiums, different from the SEC, but still a great experience. Nebraska is a good one, like you mentioned a few. Oh, so that's neat. See, I don't know as much about the game day atmosphere in Nebraska. I know they've had a huge following for a long time, um, but I didn't know as much about Nebraska on game day. So that's kind of interesting. Um, well, here's what I can tell you. And this is where I'll put my tinfoil hat back on for a moment. When you see how the committee treated Georgia this year, if there's some future year when there's like a situation of, you know, would it be like eight, nine or something like that in the college football playoff of who goes on the road, who gets a chance to stay at home. If this committee has a chance to send Georgia on the road, my guess is they probably will. So one of these days we may see one of those Big Ten stadiums up close and personal because in some future year, I'm sure the committee would love nothing more than to stick Georgia playing on the road, uh, perhaps. Um Paul Moon says, your biggest rival in high school football, IMG Academy and Bishop Sycamore. Did they ever make that Bishop Sycamore uh, documentary? That, did, did they ever make that? Um, uh, Paul Moon, the subject of Arch Manning's high school film. Yeah, not exactly the 85 Bears he was playing. That's probably fair fair to point out. But you know that also doesn't mean that, that he's a bad player either. Um but, yeah, not not the greatest of the competition. Uh, Spencer Clark on the subject of the Sooner Schooner. When it comes out, it makes the sharp turn. It looks like it's going to fall over. It has fallen over before. The crazy one, though, is still Ralphie, the Colorado Buffalo. Like, I think Dion's afraid of it. I think I probably would be there, too. Because, like, those handlers, they've got no idea where that Buffalo's going. I mean, if that Buffalo wanted to turn right and go into the stands, it's not like those people with the rope are going to stop it. That's a Huge, gigantic buffalo. Um, let's see what else. <laughs> G. Grace going in on one of the national sites. Uh, let's see what else. We're going to wrap up here in a few minutes. Oh, uh, Alan Hampton asked about Branson Robinson's progress. So the only thing I know is, is that everybody that I've talked to who knows more about both football and medical stuff than I do, everybody seems to believe this is a long process. And it's not because, you know, something's wrong with Branson or something's, he'll never be a great football player again. It's just a, it's just a tough injury. And so I don't really, when you hear me talk about running backs right now, and I, I feel like I say this a lot, but I'm going to give the disclaimer here again. When you hear me talking about running backs, you're not going to hear as much about Branson Robinson from me right now, but that's not because I don't have great belief in Robinson. It's just that I have, you know, a lot of, I would say, you know, respect for the fact that this is a very significant recovery that he's undergoing here. And I do believe that's going to, you know, perhaps take some time. Um, I, I think that's probably true. Um, so I, I, I believe that I think a reasonable hope for Robinson is that he plays at some point this season. And I, I know that sounds like really bad or whatever, but I, 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 by 2025, he could be leading the SEC in rushing. Like This is still a really good player, but I do believe he's going through a pretty significant injury recovery right now. So I, I, I don't have incredibly high expectations for Branson this season despite the fact that I still think of him as a very, very impressive prospect. Uh, Jonathan Aaron says, since I said no to Army-Navy, would West Virginia Pitt make the top ten? So that's an example. It's a little bit like the Egg Bowl. West Virginia and Pitt hate each other. Hate each other. Uh, They hate each other. That's the kind of rival that I love. That's sort of like, you know, Jerry Springer style, just throwing hands, you know. By the way, y'all see the hockey fight the other night, like right from the from the opening faceoff. Uh uh, pretty wild to see. But um, but yeah, West Virginia and Pitt, the backyard brawl, they hate each other. That's a good one. Um all right. Uh, last comment. Let me go back to dognation.com for a moment. A hunker down 93. Want to see some big things from Oscar Delp during the spring game? I think that's a good thing to look forward to seeing, and I hope you're right about that there as well. 
Um, BMAC says you want to have the running back. The defense does not want to tackle in the second half, and maybe that's what Roderick Robbins gets a chance to be here this year. Um, uh, PDT coming back to the idea of the Dog Nation uh, 5K. Uh, PD, you stay on me on that. We're going to see if we can do that at some point in time. DT says, what a compliment. I said that Graham Mertz wasn't terrible a year ago. Um, let us see where else. K Dog checking here today. Good to see that. You love that. All right, final comments. Uh, yeah, Low asking a question. So they are going to sell beer at Sanford Stadium this year. My guess is they don't sell it at G Day. Typically speaking, this is kind of in the weeds, but G Day sort of operates on the previous year's situation. Like, I think deep down, G Day is probably a little bit of a logistical challenge for Georgia. Probably a little bit of a uh, probably a nightmare. You know, a lot of work for something that doesn't generate a lot of money. Uh, probably. Um, so my guess is you will not see beer sold for G Day. I could be wrong about that, but I'm fairly certain I'm not. I may try to find out. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, I, but I, I'm guessing that's probably not. Uh, PDT on the subject of WrestleMania. He so like Cody Rhodes is in the main event, like, and you know Cody's got the bloodline coming after him, and uh, PD was talking about uh, the idea of possible run-ins um uh he says jmf you mean mjf maxwell jacob freeman that's that if he went to the wwe that'd be huge that'd be awesome Petey. if he went to the wwe that'd be amazing um because he's probably he's probably the best bad guy in the business right now um let's see anything else before we go uh back on youtube here for a moment Stick D says the best rivalry is Jay Shipes versus G Grace, which is funny. Oh, yeah, about this, Jonathan Aaron mentioning uh 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 Stefan Diggs going to the to the uh Texans. So like I like making predictions like anybody else does. Um and obviously my ego wants me to get predictions right, but sometimes I'm really fascinated when I get a prediction wrong. And I didn't think that CJ Stroud was a special quarterback. I mean, he obviously had a great game against Georgia, but most Ohio State fans will tell you he didn't really play that way at times in 2022. They almost wish that he would have played more like that throughout the season. So I didn't think that Stroud was a game-changing player in the NFL and obviously had a great rookie season. So Diggs doesn't come to uh, Houston unless there's a real belief that um, that Stroud can be the guy right now. And – I think you have to probably suggest that he will be. That's going to be a really fun offense. And, I mean, Houston's going to take a big step forward this year. You know, Buffalo is also an example of and I am exhausting my NFL knowledge, I can promise, over the course of this, you know, 30 or 40 seconds of conversation. But Buffalo is an example of just how quick these windows can close if you're not careful. Now, I don't think the Buffalo window is closing as of yet, but, man, They've had their chances against Kansas City, not been able to get over the hump, and you've got this career for Josh Allen that if you're not careful, and Falcons fans know full well what this is, right? It's like you felt like you were close with Matt Ryan, and then you just looked up, and it was just over. And Ryan was old, and he was overpaid, and Julio Jones was uh, just a salary cap travesty, and you're like, what happened? How did this all this end so fast? And in Buffalo, if you're not careful, that's the case too. So, you know, there's some people that seem to believe that that Allen wanted Diggs out. Well, you better hope you know what you're doing because, I mean, these primes of NFL careers, they are, I mean, it's the oldest cliche in the world, but NFL not for long, they don't last forever. And so Houston right now looks like a team on the rise. Buffalo is trying, I would say, desperately not to see that Josh Allen window close here with nothing but heartache and desperation because of not being able to get over Patrick Mahomes. Um, so, yeah, pretty fascinating. 
Lance D says, will Diggs blow up the locker room if he doesn't get enough catches? He's been traded twice now. Yeah, I mean, there is something to that when, you know, a player of this caliber has been moved a couple of times. You, you, you'd be well within your rights to read something in on that. Um, D-Mart also says that he thinks that Buffalo is cooked. You know, the the hourglass runs out eventually. It does for every era, so to speak. Uh, Rody Williams also picking the Georgia Clemson game. He says going to be over, you know, in the third quarter, basically. Georgia asserting its dominance. You certainly love that. Um, all right. We've got to go. Y'all check out R.S. Andrews online, rsandrews.com. Air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They show up on time. Work that's promised. The price is promised. That's what R.S. Andrews is all about. So, look cool today, but spring's essentially here. That means your air conditioning unit uh, needs to be running the way that it's supposed to. And if you're worried that yours won't be, our friends at R.S. Andrews can take care of that for you. You can find them online at rsandrews.com. They'll get you tuned back up to factory fresh specs. They'll get you running. Somebody may have told you you need a new unit. Well, eventually you probably will. But our friends at R.S. Andrews may be able to tell you how to get some new life out of that old unit. And it may only cost you $99 to get it tuned back up to factory fresh specs. So do that today online, rsandrews.com. Story after story, they've been delivering smiles. All right, have a great day. We'll see you maybe on video at some point in time over the course of the next 24 hours, but definitely back here tomorrow for Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. We'll look forward to talking to you then.